Before we get started, I would like to thank this video's sponsor, Boksu. Are you someone who loves Japanese food and or snacks? Yet living where you do, is it difficult to acquire them? Well, fret no longer. Being that it is 2022 and we are now living in the future, you can have a convenient box of Japanese snacks mailed right to your doorstep every month. Subscribing to Boksu is an awesome way to keep your shelves stocked with all sorts of Japanese snacks so that you can always get your fix. But there is so much more to appreciate about Boksu that makes them easily the best choice for this kind of service. You see, the thing about Boksu that I really love is their commitment to supply you with snacks from local family-run businesses all across Japan. So you really feel like you are not just eating something heavily processed or factory made, but rather something crafted with heart and care. Additionally, Boksu is great for giving you a taste of unique windows into Japan through their boxes, as each is packaged with a different theme in mind, often relating to the seasons. This box I am showing you here is the Pink Valentine box, one which is obviously timely because Valentine's Day is just around the corner. So this is one I will definitely be sharing with my girlfriend. For these reasons, I strongly recommend checking out Boksu if you enjoy Japanese snacks. You won't be disappointed. In fact, I say this from experience because this is not the first time I have worked with Boksu and have had a chance to try out a box. Trust me, these are tasty. But on top of that, right now is a great time to check Boksu out, because if you use my code THESHOGUNATE10 and use the link down below, you will receive 10% off, saving up to $47 on your very own authentic Japanese subscription from Boksu. Seriously, don't miss out on this amazing snack journey through Japan. So, with that said, let's get on to the video. The Great Battle of Sekigahara, the most legendary and momentous clash of the Sengoku Jidai, and perhaps even all of samurai history, was a defining moment. One which paved the road to Tokugawa Ieyasu's domination of Japan, and one which ended the reign of the Toyotomi regime. From this point onwards, throughout the remainder of the history of feudal Japan, the Tokugawa would rule the country with a near iron grip. Yet, before this series embarks on that path, we should first look back at the time when Japan was under Toyotomi authority. It was a turbulent age in which Toyotomi Hideyoshi had set forth to pick up the pieces following the death of Oda Nobunaga, Japan's first great unifier. Yet, Hideyoshi's ambition would come to win out, eventually unifying the land. But he would also set his sights on grander conquests, like the invasion of the Asian mainland through Korea. He and his family's time atop the country would see great progress, but also great turmoil in the end leading to their demise. So, let us look back at the third chapter of the Sengoku Jidai series, a time when the influence of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the man who would come to be known as Japan's second unifier, dominated the nation. We started this chapter off at episode 35, in the immediate aftermath of the Honoji incident where Akechi Mitsuhide had betrayed Oda Nobunaga, resulting in his death. It was here, Hideyoshi, who was at this point still using the family name Hashiba, rushed back east to meet Akechi Mitsuhide in battle and avenge Oda Nobunaga's death. Hideyoshi would clash with Mitsuhide at the 1582 Battle of Yamazaki, where he would defeat the Akechi and gain great renown in doing so. In episode 36, we witnessed several major events. We saw more of the fallout after Nobunaga's death, which would result in the major land grab in the east known as the Tensho Jingo Conflict, in which the Tokugawa and Hojo would compete for territory, while the small Sanada family tried to survive. But we also witnessed the famous Kyosu Conference after Akechi Mitsuhide's defeat and death, where the great leaders of the Oda clan met to determine the future of the family. It would be here, Hideyoshi, who had increased his influence after defeating Mitsuhide, would become rivals with another prominent Oda general, Shibata Katsuie. They would soon come to fight at the Great Battle of Shizugatake in 1583, a battle in which Hideyoshi would also win, cementing his grip atop the clan. In episode 37, we finally explored the situation in northern Japan throughout the Tohoku region, touching on the development of important clans and figures such as Date Masamune and its rise to power. In episode 38, 
we returned our attention back to Hideyoshi, as he would come to clash with Tokugawa Ieyasu in 1584 at the Battle of Komaki Nagakute. It would be here Ieyasu would choose to support one of Oda Nobunaga's last surviving sons against the rise of Hideyoshi, resulting in a massive clash. One that Hideyoshi technically would lose on the field. Yet with Ieyasu unable to win against the full might of Hideyoshi's expansive domain and influence, Ieyasu would later decide to submit. By episode 39, with the conflict against the Tokugawa dying down, Hideyoshi would turn his efforts back over to the west as he would order the full invasion of the island of Shikoku, home to the Chosokabe who had risen to prominence in recent years. In 1585, Hideyoshi's campaign for the island would begin and would swiftly end as the outdated Chosokabe armies of Shikoku were no match against Hideyoshi's professional armies from Honshu. With the Chosokabe defeated, they would in the end just be left to their home province of Tosa. In that very same year, we would also come to witness another major conflict in episode 40. It was here Sanada Masayuki, who had sworn himself to the Tokugawa following the Tensho Jingo conflict, would come to blows against his own overlord. Ieyasu had ordered that the Sanada were to give up Numata Castle in Kozuke Province over to the Hojo clan. Yet when Masayuki continually refused, it would prompt the Tokugawa to launch an all-out assault against the Sanada's Ueda castle. Yet against all odds, Masayuki would hold off the Tokugawa army, and in doing so, allow Hideyoshi to intervene in his favor, as the Sanada would now come under his authority and protection. Following this, we move into episode 41, in which we recapped the rise of the Shimazu clan of Kyushu as they battled hard against their main rivals, the Otomo. The might of the Shimazu war machine had pushed up far against the Otomo and their allies, and thus with no other option, the Otomo had called for aid from Hideyoshi on the main island of Honshu. Hideyoshi would oblige, yet the first Toyotomi army to land would be soundly defeated, allowing the Shimazu to briefly hold total control over all of Kyushu. However, by episode 42, the main portion of the Toyotomi army would make landfall on the island and begin a hard push south towards Satsuma. With the Shimazu bitterly outnumbered, they would in the end submit. Yet Hideyoshi would once again here display his diplomatic talent and allow them to continue to rule over the southern portion of the island under his influence. In episode 43, we examined a brief period of peace for Hideyoshi, along with political developments such as his Red Seal Edict that would be infamously remembered as the Sword Hunt, where he banned the owning of weaponry from any class below the samurai. Yet, conflict would resume again in episode 44, where Hideyoshi would at last go to war with the Hojo, laying siege to their powerful Odawara castle in 1590. It would be here Hideyoshi would turn his siege camp into more of a siege city, with all sorts of activities and entertainment, all while the Hojo withered away inside their walls. In the end, the Hojo would capitulate, and with northern clans such as the Date coming south to pledge themselves to Hideyoshi, we can finally see Japan become fully unified under the Toyotomi banner. It is that very subject we expand upon in episode 45, while also viewing dilemmas for Hideyoshi as he contemplated the future and how to maintain control over all the daimyo. This would eventually lead him to further speculate about an invasion of the mainland, something his predecessor Oda Nobunaga had dreamed of and something that Hideyoshi had considered before as well. In episode 46, Hideyoshi plunged Japan into one of the greatest East Asian conflicts history has ever seen, as he ordered the invasion of Korea in 1592, where then his forces would push up into his real target, China. In this first episode where we covered what would come to be known as the Imjin War, we saw the samurai armies make landfall in Korea, establishing a beachhead and crushing all resistance. The samurai would continue their northward campaign in episode 47, sweeping aside all the outgunned and inexperienced Korean forces while also seizing the Korean capital Seoul. However, we would also witness the bitter rivalry between Kato Kiyomasa and Konishi Yukinaga heat up as both raced to conquer more land. Yet, although the push up the peninsula was going great, the situation at sea would take a turn for the worst as the Korean admiral Yi Sun Shin would begin to thrash the Japanese navy. By episode 48, the Japanese had seized Pyongyang in northern Korea, and Kato Kiyomasa would even launch a brief expedition across the Korean border and into Manchuria. 
For a moment, despite bitter Korean guerrilla warfare, Japan held a grip over almost all of Korea. Yet with the situation for Japan at sea deteriorating, their grip was a weak one, and soon China would at last arrive to intervene on Korea's behalf. It was here, with dwindling reinforcements and supplies, the Japanese would at last be forced back. This would lead to a brief ceasefire and peace negotiations in episode 49. Although, things would not go as planned, and there would be much confusion and disagreement during the peace talks, as Hideyoshi wished to receive more than China was willing to give. Embarrassed by how the negotiations would go, Hideyoshi would prep for war once again. In episode 50, Hideyoshi tried to fix as much as he could with his army and navy situation before launching a second invasion of Korea. Once again, his forces would score early successes on both land and sea. Yet soon enough, the Japanese navy would once again be crushed, and their advance on land would come to stall out. And it is here, with his health failing and believing he had done enough to prove his might to China and Korea, Hideyoshi began to recall his forces home before at last dying in 1598. In episode 51, we saw the final actions Hideyoshi took in aims to preserve his family's power before his death, as he would establish a council of five regents to watch over his young son Hideyori until he came of age. Yet with his own passing and with the samurai armies pulling out of Korea, the future of Japan was questionable at best. In episode 52, Tokugawa Ieyasu, a man who Hideyoshi had long feared and tried to keep in check, began making moves to assert his authority over the government. Being that he had kept his armies out of the war in Korea, along with his prominent land holdings, Ieyasu was now easily seen as the mightiest daimyo in all of Japan. With his intentions increasingly dubious, we would finally see pushback from Ishida Mitsunari, who wished to halt the rising influence of Ieyasu in the wake of Hideyoshi's death. By episode 53, tensions were starting to boil hotter and hotter as Ieyasu continued to stir the pot. It is here we start to see many clans begin taking sides either for or against the Tokugawa. These two factions would come to be known as the Eastern and Western Armies with Ieyasu leading the Eastern faction, and Ishida Mitsunari and his Toyotomi loyalists amassed to the West. And we can immediately start to see that problems were rising for Ishida Mitsunari, as his own low approval was causing many lords to flock to Ieyasu's side. Finally, by episode 54, Japan was at war once again, as conflict erupted between both the Eastern and Western factions, from all the way up in the North to all the way down in the South. As Ieyasu was forced to abandon his position at Osaka and return home to Edo in face of the threat of the Uesugi clan. In episode 55, with the Uesugi threat held in check by his allies to the north, Ieyasu sought to march back west to take the fight to Ishida Mitsunari. Yet, in order to hold off Sanada Masayuki, who had too declared himself for the western army, he decided to send his son and heir, Hidetara, at the head of an army to mask the Sanada's Ueda castle before continuing on to link up with the main Tokugawa army. But, it was here we see Hidetara decide to go glory hunting, laying siege to Ueda, although he would be no match for Masayuki, who would completely repel him and force him to be late to link up with his father's army. By episode 56, both the eastern and western armies would come face to face at the Kuisegawa, where they would both briefly skirmish, resulting in an early western army victory. Yet the positioning of Ishida Mitsunari's forces would cause him stress, being that he could potentially be bypassed by Ieyasu. Ignoring the advice of his senior veteran allies such as Shimazu Yoshihiro, Mitsunari would decide to move his forces back to a location known as Sekigahara. And at last, in episode 57, both the eastern and western armies fully met at the Great Battle of Sekigahara where six hours of hard fighting would amount to tens of thousands dead. It would be here, Ishida Mitsunari would deploy his army in a manner that would completely snuff out the Tokugawa. Yet, with so many generals on his side angered by him or debating their own position, he would be betrayed by more than one of his allies, leading to the total defeat of the Western Army. Ieyasu had won, and the road was clear for the Tokugawa to seize Japan. This has been a recap of all the episodes during the third chapter of the Sengoku Jidai series, the time when Toyotomi Hideyoshi would come to rule Japan and unify it under his banner. 
Yet now, after Hideyoshi's death and failure to secure a lasting legacy and position for his family atop the country, Tokugawa Ieyasu has finally achieved what has long been his ambition, as he moves forward to rule the land himself. In the coming final chapter of the Sengoku Jidai series, we will come to see the birth of his new shogunate in Edo, and eventually the last major conflict of the period, the legendary Sieges of Osaka. The clash, which will be the final gasp of the Toyotomi, and the rise of a figure who has come to be known as the last Sengoku hero. Ieyasu may have won, and the land may now be firmly under him, but this age of war has one final major battle left in it. I want to once again thank Boxu for sponsoring this video. Please don't forget to check out the link down below and use the promo code the Shogunate 10 to receive 10% off on your own authentic Japanese box of snacks from Boxu. And with that said, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.